Right, to, to start off with, I, I thought it'd be useful to actually look at Rousey and, and, and actually go back in time. Uh, many of you know uh, the uh, 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 archaeological importance of Rousey, uh, and it was uh, really significant in terms of Neolithic studies with the work of Gordon Child, who you see on the far side there with the, uh, with the half, half waistcoat glasses there. Um, uh, his work at Rinio uh, establishing Scara Bray as being an earthen site. It was actually published as a Pictish village. Um, uh, but it, it was the stratigraphy that he had from Rinio which was so significant. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Calendar and Grant uh, and, and their work in the 1930s looking at so many of the monuments that we have on Rousey. So uh, really significant. And when we start thinking in the modern era of archaeology, the work of uh, uh, Lord Redfrew uh, 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 in, in his early work uh, looked at new technologies, radiocarbon dating, for example, but he also brought aspects of new theory of geography into archaeology. And there you can see one of his early maps that looked at the um, uh, distribution of lithic chamber cairns and, and, and land and, and looking at uh, 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 potential, potential areas, potential resource areas. So, so that, that was an inspirational uh, element of the way archaeology was moving in the late 60s, early 70s. Right, I said I'd show you some archaeology that we normally associate with coastal erosion. And we first started uh, looking at, uh, at sites of Rousey because Judy Gibson was uh, uh, quite concerned about how many in, in such a, a small area of these sites were suffering active erosion. And this is the Burnt Mound at Yorval. And, uh, and, and you can see what is a, a traditional uh, uh, erosion face uh, with, with archaeology um, uh, coming out. And Swadra is a complete contrast to that. Just to give you a location of where Swadra is, uh, uh, you can see the map there. And uh, just if you look at Iron Hallow and just follow across from Iron Hallow, you'll see uh, Swadra. To the north, we've got the sites of North Howe, Mid Howe, and South Howe, or Brock the farm land of Brock. I've been looking a little bit, I thought it would be interesting just to have a quick look there. And right down the bottom there, we've got uh, uh, the, uh, um, the Birdland site at Yorville. If we have a quick look at Yorville, just, just to give you a flavour of, of, of the archaeology there, uh, you can see that cliff face cleaned, and you can see the archaeological stratigraphy of the lower part. And what we have there is a Birdland complex, with uh, what's interesting is uh, going off on the side, we've got fresh uh, freshwater uh, lock uh, deposits. And uh, as, as we look at the bottom there, we've got the archaeology of South Howe um, uh, next to the uh, Mid Howe uh, Cairn. You can see in the distance the settlement of, of scale where Ingrid Mainland and, and Dan Lee are presently working. And uh, Again, we're dealing with a cliff exposure. Both of those contrast quite dramatically to the archaeology that we're finding at Swandro, where, where it's low lying and the sea is coming in. And every time it's having an aggressive effect, like a giant vacuum thing as, uh, as it tide comes out, is sucking out the finer archaeological sediments and the big storm events taking uh, the more major stones away. So uh, we're seeing uh, a real problem uh, at that site. So we've, we've decided to focus our efforts at Swandro rather than looking at a number of sites. So that's why the activity has been so intense there. We're not just looking at the archaeology in terms of smash and grab trying to save information. We're trying to look at it in terms of a research agenda. And I think that's really important for archaeological work, that you have big research questions to try and answer. And, uh, and, and one of the things that we, 
we're really interested in is this aspect of deep time. Sites with long stratigraphic sequences where you can see how people living there adapted and changed to, to changing times in terms of climatic differences, climatic changes, uh, new ideas coming in and also we, we, we can see some dramatic cultural events. Uh, for us at uh, Swandro, one of the most dramatic events uh, that we're interested in trying to find the, the uh, evidence for is the arrival of the very first Scandinavian peoples, it, it, the, the Viking presence on that site. Well, uh, we're, we're also interested in, in trying to understand the context of the site, not just looking at a site where it is, but, but going out into the landscape and trying to put it into a landscape setting. And, and because we're dealing with, with sites where the marine element, the coastal element is so important, we need to understand the, 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 the way that the people living on those sites interacted with the sea uh, in, in terms of resources for the, you know, for the beaches but, or, and fishing and uh, communication. Because the sea we see today perhaps as a bit of a barrier, but in the past it was a natural highway. Uh, we're also interested in terms of uh, being able to uh, look at the archaeology in, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, creating awareness to people trying to uh, 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 portray the, the fragility of the resource that we have uh, and to uh, 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 try and be open to the public and uh, it, we're the guests who come in uh, to, to do this and we don't want to be seen behind closed doors, we want to be open so that everybody can feel ownership within that project and that's why it's so good to come to a meeting like this and to talk to a local society uh, uh, about the work that we're doing. And the important thing that we're doing is we're training our classical students. Uh, this is within a training excavation. So we're training the next generation of, of archaeologists. So, so that, that's always been a, a important part of our work for, for the last 40 years. I talked about the landscape context. Uh, we, we looked at the landscape around. You can see the various test trenches that we put, put in. This is the back of Swadro. Uh, and here, what I was interested in trying to see was the agricultural land and try, trying to look at the evidence for um, manuring of soils and the creation of, of, of deep soils over time. And you can see the contrast in the modern day plough soil where there is no um, uh, uh, man-made uh, uh, soils where, where, where it's just the natural um, the topsoil going down to the, to the bedrock. And you compare that to the bottom slide where we've got much deeper soil. And if you look at the lower part, there's lots of carbon flecking and, and, and other material showing that early manuring practice that, that was going on that actually led to the creation of these deeper fertile so soils. Um, the, the idea of education, obviously with a university uh, uh, background, as I said, is really important, this, uh, this concept of training students. Uh, but the other thing that we're very keen on trying to do is, is to actually uh, uh, have some continuity with our students. So we, we have with the students who started off as undergraduates with their first excavation experience with us, coming back, taking on more responsibility. Uh, we've even had, we have students who've worked with us. Uh, Bradford's very different from most other universities that, have a, that normally have a three-year course. We have a placement year, and we've had students who work on post-excavation for that third year, uh, before their final year, in which they may do dissertations, and then perhaps they go on to do a master's and a PhD. So, in effect, we, we, we create what we term a pyramid of learning. But that, that has huge benefits to the project. Um, and of course, uh, uh, being open and trying to uh, uh, 
to say is what, what we're doing it, it is an important aspect. So, so uh, that's the, the background behind the, the project. I, I mentioned uh, Nick Howe, uh, of course most, most of you will know it very, very well and have been there. Uh, I think it's interesting just to be reflective, just to look at, the, uh, uh, at, at that site. Um, and, and, and think about the architecture that we see. Of course, this is a this is a rock with, with a satellite around it. And uh, what what is interesting is that just nearby we have the chamber uh, that the store can uh, admit have as well. And we, we we seem to have an association beginning to appear of of Neolithic. Uh, 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 tombs. We got. We have Continental Pyramid and um, the How How, where we have Iron Age sites and Neolithic sites, and Swandro seems to be fitting into that pattern. Um, the reason I put in uh, um, at the site of Mid How also was to say that we we done some field work uh, around that. Again, looking for these deep soils. Again, being able to identify them and be able to. Uh, identify what we think is a boundary ditch to that field system. Uh, just a stone's throw away from the uh, Stalkham Midhow is the site of Southhow, which we looked at, we, we, we cleaned up. It, it's a rock site with, with ivy structures uh, around it, so one can envisage an, a, 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 a rock with, with, with a with, with a village like settlement around it, very similar to what we see uh, at, at Midhow. But what's interesting about this site is that it goes on into the historic period, and what we're seeing just a little bit down the coastline, if you look at the far side of that side, slide, you can just make out um, a piece of scaffolding there uh, where people are working, and the side on the um, on the far side there shows you what they're, they're cleaning up. And, and what we have there is wall upon wall, um, an intense sequence of occupation uh, that goes from the late north through to the uh, 18th century. Uh, and then we've got on top of it the, the, the ruins of the, 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 the farm of Brock, which was abandoned in, in the 19th century. I said, I think, at the very beginning that this coastline was very intensive. Uh, this is just a map of the protected areas, the, the areas that are protected by law in terms of shape and monument status. And uh, uh, the bottom site there is the uh, site of West Ness with the very famous Viking burials. And the site that we're working on is the next one up, the, the, the second one up. That, that's the location of Swan Road. Then we have Rolling Arth and, and so on going, going further up. Uh, it's important, I think, to look at um, the Westness uh, Cemetery site because it's of particular interest. Uh, here we've got evidence of first generation. Uh, Scandinavian peoples, uh, recent uh, work look, looking at the uh, uh, scientific evidence from, from isotopes from, the, from two of these individuals that we see uh, in, in the boat graves put these people coming from north of the Arctic Circle from, from, from that Norwegian coastline um, high up and uh, I think one of the, 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 the female burials, is that right, actually comes from Ireland probably. Ireland or the Western Isles. Uh, Ireland or the Western Isles, yeah. So, so there we're, we're, we're seeing early settlers, first generation settlers in there. And the other thing that's interesting is that we're also seeing Pictish graves there, earlier Pictish graves. Um, so, it, um, I think really significant when we look at the geographic situation of where, where the uh, uh, West Ness is to where Swadro is and Sigurd Callan who excavated those sites in, in the early um, 
80s, late 70s, early 80s, also looked at the remains of the Norse Hall. Uh, and in fact, what we have is the whole of that area uh, uh, from the Norse Hall to the down of Swandro, which we're looking at at the moment, uh, is, is, you can see it quite clearly if you visit the site now, uh, is very clearly one large settlement mound. Uh, and you can see the, uh, there's very little uh, uh, published on the uh, Norse uh, uh, buildings that uh, Sigrid Cullen worked. We're still waiting for the publication of, of that work. But this is one of the photographs that does survive. And you can see the, the narrow swan road, the distance, uh, the peak of it is, is uh, behind the individual with the surveying staff. You can just see that in the centre of the photograph. Um, uh, even though quite a large area is stripped, uh, they excavated the upper parts and they didn't go beneath those north slayers into the Iron Age elements. But we, we've been able to get some idea of, of what's happening there. Uh, this is uh, an early photograph of the uh, now you can see where the people are standing and you, you, you can just see the, the mound and, and the and its relationship to the coast. And uh, this is an early geophysical survey of that area. And the intensity of noise that you see on that, uh, on that plot it, within that circle is characteristic of the, uh, 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 these deep stratified sites where, where you have uh, so much burnt material and walls and so on. It, it's not a clear picture that you would get in southern Britain. It, it comes across as quite a noisy uh, picture. Uh, we, we, have, we have better refinement on that. Um, the, the, uh, the Archaeological Institute of, of uh, the UHI um, has been working with the uh, German Archaeological Institute and uh, at Easter did a massive survey. You, this is a rig with flux gate radiometers. Uh, if any of you have seen Time Team with John Gator walking up and down with a, a with a, an instrument, um, sometimes it was a pair of instruments. This, this is a series of flux gates mounted on a boom being towed uh, with a GPS uh, 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 in, in the center of it. So uh, once getting very accurate readings over a large area. So you, you can see it, the coverage is from west less far beyond Mid Howe and over uh, what is uh, uh, North House? Uh, massive coverage. Uh, very luckily, um, that the, they did us a favour by going in with a, a more sensitive instrument to the area that we're interested in, and we can see um, a, a close something. You can see what I mean about the sort of very noisy picture that one gets with these uh, in intensive uh, uh, peaks and uh, positives and negatives that represent. Uh, a, a settlement complex. Uh, but what it does show quite clearly is that we're dealing with a, with a, with a, with a settlement mound. And we've lost probably two thirds of it, I would have thought. Uh, this is the site as it was found, and it was found by Julie uh, looking back at the now, and she saw the tops of these upright stones just picking out, coming out of the beach. All the beach cobbles were laid horizontally, uh, uh, or near horizontally, and then there was a series of, of, of what appeared to be set stones, just the very top of them protruding from the beach. And with clearing that, there were quite clearly uh, orthostats, st uh, set stone settings, uh, which actually turned out to be a, a, a building. And I'll show you that a little bit later. Uh, this is the extent of the, the site uh, where we have the majority of it open in two, uh, 2015 here and you can see, I think th this is uh, 2012, this photograph was taken, uh, which shows the, the chambered cairn. Uh, you can see a series of casement walls going, going up um, and uh, uh, this is very much the, the early stages. Now, the, the problem with this site is that it is eroding at quite a, a, a fast rate. We, we've been able to 
uh, look at it, as I said, in 2012. We re-looked at it in 2015, only three years later, and what we saw... Did I do two then? Yeah, what we saw was the um, uh, loss of, of an awful lot of information uh, because of the daily tides coming out and dragging material away. And you can see, uh, th 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 this is just a high tide, it's not an extreme high tide. Um, so, what we've been doing is recording it the best way we can using photogrammatic techniques to develop 3D models. You would have seen that with the work that Martin's doing uh, at the Cairns and, and Nick's been doing. Uh, it's becoming an established technique. Uh, we're also using laser scanning technology as well and trying to amalgamate both data sets to try and get a high resolution uh, uh, picture of what's there. So uh, the advantage of these techniques is that you can zoom right in with great accuracy. Uh, they look a bit fuzzy there. Uh, remember, these are not photographic images. These are laser scanned images. Uh, but you can go in with great, uh, and you can tilt them, you can, you can look at them from the top, you can look at them from the side, you can look at them from an angle, you can turn it around. So, uh, computer technology plays an important part uh, within our work these days. Uh, and uh, we, we have uh, uh, lost, I think, much of this earlier material. This, is, this was opened in 2015 and 2016, and we, we, we've got a, 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 an early wall. This is underneath the iron age sequences that's butting the, the casement wall, but we've got some very good dating evidence from um, underneath that, that that we're hoping to get radiocarbon dated. Um, And again, just to give you a, 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 an impression, this is the edge of the the, the, the chain. This is this is halfway up the, the sequence. You can see where that red line is. That that's where high tide reached that day. And this is the tide, This is at low tide. You can see where the seaweed's been left and and, and, and so on. So the archaeology, as I say, is is disappearing with each tide. Uh, this is the scan data. Um, uh, uh, that we have from uh, uh, 2015 and we've lost a huge amount of, of information uh, if I can uh, if I can just uh, get, if, you, if you look there we've lost a lot of the wall face there that was complete in 2012 and most of this material here is missing from that was there in 2012, it's, it's been sucked out and, and we've lost that. And I think from the work that we've done this year, uh, we can say with hand on heart that we've lost a huge amount more of information uh, and, and most of that lower, uh, lower couple of casement rings. So uh, we're, we're in a, a quandary in terms of fighting against time. And, uh, we, uh, and we've just had Shedden One Ring consent because this is a protected monument that we can actually excavate on the landward side to try and save as much of the archaeology as possible. And that only came through on the, the first Monday we, we started work uh, late in the afternoon. So we had to wait before we could start opening until we had that final um, uh, consent come through. It had to be signed off by the uh, uh, Minister of State, uh, but unfortunately that Monday coincided with the reshuffle that it was. But, but luckily we, we managed to get that. Um, this is higher up and we can see the passageway coming through. Now what's interesting about that um, is the, our deposits over the, o overlying that, that rubble and you can see the in that side there you can see the brown you won't be able to make out the uh, the bone the individual bones there but uh, what we had was several sheep and a couple of cats as well and the sheep had very large blade marks butchery marks 
So clearly not Neolithic, clearly uh, much later. And a characteristic that we've seen before with Viking Age uh, uh, butchery techniques. And the scat, the, the cats also had little nicks in the bones, suggesting perhaps uh, that they, they may have been possibly skinned. Um, so uh, uh, we're, we're, we're thinking that this is representative of a, a later phase. Uh, added to that, the finding of a coin of Enred that you see there uh, in, 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 in some of the deposits uh, oh, oh, in that same area um, suggests very strongly he's a king of Northumbria. Uh, again, strongly suggests that we're dealing with a uh, uh, perhaps a Viking period um, uh, activity. Gareth Williams from the British Museum, who's an expert in coinage of this period, uh, uh, strongly suggests that it, it, it isn't uh, trade things with, with Northumbria. He thinks it, it is actually coming with Scandinavians. Uh, uh, it, it's a big jump because we've got no other cultural material, but we can we can say uh, we've got the right sort of activity in that uh, that time period uh, within the top of the chamber too. Um, and again, uh, the, the scanning uh, that uh, we're, we're doing uh, uh, increases our knowledge. This isn't a photograph, it's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it, 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 it's made it's from computer generated data from, from individual points that have been scanned. But again, uh, that's it in plan view. But you, you, as I said, you can rotate it around and flip it. Uh, that's the same data flipped on its edge, so you can actually see it in elevation section. We did have, we were able to have open a small area on the top of the now from uh, a previous shed moment, that application at the very beginning, and. Uh, uh, the idea was just to evaluate and see what was there, just take the turf off, clean it off, and see what was there. And we began to see that there was uh, some complicated structural uh, evidence, that there was set stones, that there was areas of, of, of midden uh, uh, and some areas of burning, and uh, that, that gave us a, a, a good clue that, that things weren't, uh, there was a lot of archaeology there, that it wasn't just a uh, a, a very simple sequence, and you can see uh, some of the stonework. That that's the edge section uh, that, that shows uh, some wall faces and stone butting up against it. Anyway, uh, this this that gives you a little bit of background to the chamber can itself that we've been looking at. Uh, what I want to do now is just go through the iron age sequence that we've, we've looked at very, very quickly. Uh, you can see, I hope, the, uh, the archaeology, we've cleared all the tonnage of beach pebble away. And it, and it is tonnage. It, 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 it is very time consuming taking up that material. But underneath that, we, we, we have archaeological survival. And it's quite remarkable survival as well. Um, we, we've, We've lost a lot of the lower elements uh, because of the sea is taken away. Uh, and as you, as you go from the very bottom, you, you come up in a series of terraces, which are quite literally, you're stepping up in time. Uh, at the bottom of the sequence, uh, we, we have a building uh, which, which we'll, we'll have a look at, uh, which uh, 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 dates to the first century BC, first century AD. Uh, we know we've got material underneath that, uh, very difficult to understand because it's been so badly truncated by the sea, but we, 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 we've been able to sample some of it. We haven't got a date for that yet. And then as you go up, we're getting later Iron Age buildings and better archaeological survival. And right at the top of the sequence, we, 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 we found it really good survival. Uh, we picked these buildings right at the top. Uh, so, as I said, we're dealing with a settlement mound. And I thought I'd just show you what a settlement mound looks like from the work that we did in Shetland. Uh, this was 12 years work working in, in southern Shetland at uh, a site called Skadness. And uh, there you can see with the, the, the site. This is 
This is a multi-period site. Uh, it goes from the Neolithic all the way through to the 1960s. And uh, at, at its very heart is this brock with an Iron Age village. But you can see, if you look at the far side, the depth of stratigraphy. Right at the top, we've got a wall that dates to the 18th century. That building went out of use, we know, in the 19th century. And, and from there down, we've just got an immense archaeological sequence of building uh, constructions, buildings being modified, buildings being pulled down, rubbish being poured in, in and this gradual build-up year after year, generation after generation. So what we're in effect looking at at Swandro is something very similar to this. But without uh, um, the same architecture, but, but, but that same sort of sequence. Uh, you can see here that where the um, red is and the black and white scale, if you look just below that black and white scale, you, you may be able to see the truncation of uh, the truncation of the uh, uh, of the archaeology there by the sea. It, it, it's almost sliced it away in a natural sec section, going all the way along. Uh, but if, if you try to interpret and understand the stones and what they mean. We, we can begin to make out a case of what actually is there. Uh, it, it, it is the top part of, 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 of a curvature of a roundhouse. And uh, what we have um, on the far side there, uh, if you look, we've got one enormous flagstone with two little niches cut in the stone. Uh, so that is the flooring of one of the cells. And those little... Uh, um, uh, black semicircles are, are pe are, have been pecked out, the stone's been chipped away, uh, and it's a support for a wooden post. And what we seem to have, I think, is a storage area, a sort of mezzanine level that would have gone around the circumference. So in the centre, it would have been open to the roof, but around the, around the edge, there, there would have been a higher storage area. And in Shetland, we, we've got good proof of that because we, we actually have. Uh, large buildings similar to, 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 to this uh, that, that uh, uh, survive to uh, uh, two meters in, in height with a scarce ledge constructed, the same sort of ledge you would find in the rock actually within the roundhouse. Uh, the lower slide there, uh, <coughs> you, 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 if you look to the side, um, top center, you, you're, you're, you can make out that shape which you should be able to see uh, transposed into the close-up there. What we're dealing with there is, is an oven around the edge of the, the, the building. Uh, it's quite fragmentary there, but we found a complete one, almost identical to it. And because we dismantled it, we, 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 we knew exactly what this was. Uh, the, the, the complete example was at that site <coughs> at Skatness. So um, we're, we're beginning to uh, get a, a very good understanding of, of what's happening, and uh, if we if, if we if, if we look out and pull out a wee bit, you, you can see we've got uh, uh, lots of other things happening uh, uh, around it. Uh, we've got a well on one side, and uh, stalling of various buildings occurring uh, 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 um, further up the sequence there. I just want to concentrate on two other buildings just very briefly. Uh, one is this uh, structure here, this roundhouse. Um, it, it's quite a, a, an interesting building. It's multi-phase. We, we certainly have a Pictish level within it. We, we excavated that and came down to this uh, uh, flag level within, within the building. You can see the flags going, going around. When we took off the flags, uh, we came across the deposit that, that was above this that had that coin in. And that's a 4th century uh, numerous. It was minted in Trier. It's from, uh, it, on the, it, you can see the, uh, the, the emperor uh, uh, standing, uh, hold, holding objects he's had. He's actually standing within the galley. And uh, it, it's, the, uh, it, it's a coin of Constance. 
and it was minted between 348 and 350 AD. So we've got a very good uh, date uh, for that coin, and it probably wasn't in circulation for that long, uh, because uh, it was very short mintage, uh, and uh, uh, the big problem is because this, this, this could have been kept as a curio and passed down for generations and generations. It, it's not as good as uh, a, a, a piece of data evidence uh, as one might like, but uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's still an extremely useful uh, artifact to be able to recover and, and, and see. Uh, the other building, oh, just the bottom shop, just to mention the stone tank. And, and we, we, we've got earlier phases of, of that building uh, occurring. Now this building I'm getting quite excited about because this is a, a, a pictures building where we've, uh, we, we, we've got uh, a, a very good understanding of what's happening. You can see a central half, you can see the, 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 the dark material there. Uh, if you look at the top, uh, you see there's a ombre type covered uh, a recessed uh, uh, area uh, within the wall there with those two large blocks of that large flat stone covering it. Um, if you look beyond that flat stone, can you see some coarse walling? <coughs> Sorry if I'm in your way, I can't move very far, <laughs> so I do apologise. Uh, but uh, uh, what we have there within that, uh, that walling is uh, uh, signs of, of a much earlier building and this cellular building, this pictures building, had been constructed within that. So that building got out of use and, and they built this single skinned walled uh, structure within it and backed behind that, that wall that they packed it with rubble. So, so what, what we're actually seeing here is a, 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 a whole sequence of settlement and replacement of buildings uh, within that little uh, little piece. Um, we began to find a lot of metalworking debris and uh, you, you can see there some little spheres of slag. Um, they're almost like black, almost ball bearing shape, they look like fine little ball bearings. But, uh, and they represent fire welding, where, you, you're, where a blacksmith is, is forging still together. Um, using wrought raw iron, perhaps a carbon steel, and, and we know this from the evidence of, of the metallurgy from that period that they were capable of, of actually having steel edges. You wouldn't want a knife, for example, to be all steel; it would be very fragile. Uh, so you you would need it to have a, be a composite of raw iron, which is which is very soft, but it's very malleable, and you can bend and will, and will take stresses. Whereas the if you have uh, iron with a greater carbon content, uh, it's very fragile and can't take the stresses. But if you put the two together with a cutting edge that is of steel and, and the back, a large part of the blade, which is raw iron, you have a very effective combination of flexibility that can take the stresses and strength of maintaining a really good cutting edge. So this is quite sophisticated metal working. Uh, that, that we're seeing there, and uh, we, we've been very fortunate in having Jerry McDonald, who's uh, uh, an, an expert in, in this field. He, he, he was a colleague for 20 years at the University of Bradford teaching archaeometallurgy, and he was English Heritage archaeometallurgist uh, for a long time before that. Um, so he's devoted his entire career uh, to archaeological uh, metallurgy. And uh, uh, not only has he looked at the slags and the, and, and the, and the residues that we, we've got for the iron working, he's also looked at the evidence for copper uh, alloy working. And we, we, from that building, we've got a number of uh, crucibles and mold fragments and so on, and he's been able to look at that. And within doing that work, you can see the, the spectra that are generated. Uh, from his XRF machine that he's using there uh, to analyse the, the, those fragments. He became extremely excited because he was seeing uh, uh, bronze and brass 
being used. Now you should only see bronze in this period. You shouldn't be using uh, uh, seeing, seeing brass. So he, he became very interested. And I should develop that little bit of the tale uh, a little bit later on. So that's the background to the project. That, that, that's how we arrived at the position we're at now. So I thought it's a good idea to, to begin to look at 2018 and see what we're, we're beginning to do. And the story is changing day by day. So if you do get an opportunity to come out and see us, please do. And uh, perhaps Kaz will say a little bit more about some of the things that are, are, are programmed to happen uh, uh, at the end. Um, uh, we do welcome visitors. Visitors are extremely welcome, and we've got a series of events, especially on Sundays, where 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 uh, we 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 have uh, uh, some uh, um, uh, uh, interpretive materials for you for people to look at and play with, and, and, and ask questions about how things were used and so on. So I, I, I think that is a really valuable uh, element to, to to what we do. Cause Looking at archaeology um, just gives you one dimension, and there's only so much of stonework and people um, working away that you, one can take. But if, if you can be interactive with material, uh, which you can't normally be in, in using genuine archaeological material, but if you can, if you can actually have uh, material that's replicated and, and be able to uh, look at uh, past technology and actually handle things. I think that adds another dimension. So we brought that in for, for, for the visitor experience on Sundays. Anyway, to Jerry, going back to Jerry McDonald and what he's, he, he, he's finding. Uh, he got so excited with the, those results that he's come back again with us this year. And he's uh, been uh, actually taking samples and using his XRF on the floor. And not only have we got those those bowl fragments, he's actually been able to look and analyze the the uh, 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 floor surface around the hearth, and uh, he he he's got really strong traces of copper alloy working uh, the, uh, around the, the hearth, and uh, I mean, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that a little bit later on. Um, what he's doing with that machine is that he, he, he's using um, uh, the, the XRF, which, which is the, the machine that you see there. It, it, it's a technique called X-ray. You, you fire a beam of X-rays, and, and you're looking at the scatter coming back. It's for, so it's X-ray fluorescence. And, and so you can use it on, on objects. Um, it's non-destructive, so it is of huge value. Uh, as an archaeological tool, but you, one's able to get uh, 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 accurate uh, uh, results out on the composition by looking at it in a qualitative or quantitative form, as you see there. And uh, and what what he's particularly interested in uh, here's here's one of the spectra, and you've got a lot of background because uh, we, we've got the the clay particles and so on of the soil. Uh, which we're not really interested in, but what we are interested in is the evidence of metal working that we see from the copper, the CU, um, and uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, the zinc and uh, lead and uh, tin profiles. And uh, if, if, we, if we look at some of the spectra that needs to be able to generate, uh, we, we're getting very clear signatures of those. So he's extremely excited. Uh, you may hear him on Radio Orkney. I'm not sure they came out to uh, um, uh, uh, talk to us today. Uh, if he's not on, it, 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 I think he's going to go out over the winter, so you may, you may hear him uh, at some point over the winter. So he's been working very hard looking at both the uh, taking samples and carrying out uh, magnetic susceptibility work. Uh, the magnetic susceptibility, when he's interested there, is trying to look at where smithing took place and, and it's the uh, distribution of hammer scale. When a smith hits the red hot metal, you get those sparks coming off and, and those are tiny fragments of slag and metal which, which you can identify. Um, 
he got really excited as well by some of the finds that we're getting more crucibles and so on. Uh, but this, this one in particular I think is quite interesting. This is part of a trier and you can see it's got a very glassy black edge to it where it's been well, vitrified by the high heat. Uh, but at the top you can see uh, a, a very smooth rounded area. This is where the, the nozzle, the bellows, would be put. So it would be packed with clay and the heat generated is fired into this vitreous lump. So, you, so what one would have is this clay protecting the leather of the bellows and somebody pumping away, bringing out the heat of the, of the half to allow this metal working. And what's really exciting, I think, is that he's been able to look at the plan of that using these scientific techniques, actually work out how people worked within that building. We've been able to populate it with activity, which is a very rare thing in archaeology to, to be able to do that with any confidence. But because of the distribution of where things are that he's found, uh, if we look at this photograph, we can actually see. Um, you would go down into this building. <coughs> I've been standing on the spot, so I may fall over, but don't worry. So we've got a, a set of steps going down into this building. You turn the corridor, come through. Do you see we've got a threshold stone there? There's a stone there with a, a hole in it. It's a pivot uh, for the door. So the door would open out. And then we've got a bar hole coming through here. So you could actually fasten the door from the inside. Um, we know that this is not the original um, height of the hearthstone, it's actually a broken edge because we had the top, top part it sheared off and, and, and broken over uh, but the, the original hearthstone would have been up somewhere like that so if you imagine a, a, a stone there protecting the hearth from any drafts coming through so this is the business end of the hearth and this is the area where he's getting all this intense material for copper working and smithing as well and we've got these two stones and if you look very carefully at those stones you won't see it on this slide but if you were there and to peer down at those stones you would see they're very heavily packed so uh, uh, they've been quite carefully placed there and used as angles it's very clear uh, and we've got that scatter of material around them to so, in terms of, of, of how this building was used, we can imagine that the, uh, the, the smith is actually working here, using, taking crucibles and, and, and so on from the heat of the, the fire, and he's using these two stones in, in, in the process, uh, possibly having this as a storage area, he's reaching, reaching for items. Uh, we can say with some confidence, we think they're looking at the, 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 the space, the, the bellows, and this, is, this area here, we found fragments of the trio as well, uh, that this is the area which the, 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 the poor, the poor so-and-so helping here will be pumping away, uh, trying to uh, uh, get the temperature up, so he could actually be doing these, this metal working. So that's, that's just one little piece of work that we're continuing from, from, from last year to get maximised the amount of information that we can get from it. Uh, if we're looking at the narrow swan row, this is just before we started. Uh, we used different survey techniques, and again, you've probably seen these being used at Broca and uh, uh, Nessa Broca and, uh, uh, and the Cairns, the use of. Uh, 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 cameras on a pole to be able to get 3D photographic images and the use of the laser scanner and again uh, trying to make a full record prior to any intervention that we're making and this is the uh, uh, one of the plans uh, computer generated plans of the site so what you're seeing is is differences in height we, what we have here is readings at um, uh, at at um, uh, five, five centimeter intervals go, going. <coughs> so we've got a contour that's been put in the computer package that, 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 that clearly shows that the high points as, as deep red. 
But what it does show quite nicely, if you follow the, the, the orange round, that's the extent of the, the settlement mound. And you, you see that very clearly as you approach the site um, from the information board that CAS has, has put up. So if you do come and visit us, have a look at the landscape, where the excavation sits, because that, 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 that is all part of our understanding. And uh, the, you can see the, the excavation area uh, put, put in, in there, so that's where we're, we're working. And uh, more or less straight away down to uh, archaeology, but we're taking up off the turf. And uh, this is a, a, a view, um, a, an aerial view look, looking uh, um, through into the area that we've opened up. And you can see quite an extensive area, and it's beginning at this stage to make some sense. Uh, one or two interesting finds that we've had from the very beginning of our work there, it, uh, we've got this uh, uh, double-sided cone. You see we've got teeth on either side, and we have an iron rivet. Uh, um, we think, again, this is probably uh, um, uh, belonging to the Scandinavian rather than Pictish period with the use of iron uh, within that. <coughs> but, uh, uh, it's just a, a small, small plate. These curves would have been made in a number of actual plates with a bar fastening them together. Uh, and this looks like to be what, the end plate of, of the cone. And uh, we're getting some exciting archaeology. We can see we've got a wall coming through. We've, we, we've got a huge complex of stonework appearing there. Uh, and uh, we're, we're gradually going down and defining uh, what, we're, what we have there. A number of structures coming, in, come, coming out, a number of structural elements. And uh, again, it's multi, multi period. We've been seeing modifications, blockings, new, new walls being added. Uh, and I'll show you just at the end of the sequence uh, um, a, a slide that illustrates that. Uh, but it just gives you a, a general idea. This, this was at the beginning of the week. Uh, things have moved on uh, quite considerably since then. Uh, we have a lot of evidence for uh, cobbled roofing that's collapsed. And I think a number of these buildings uh, and, and, and areas, we, we've got quite deep sequences. So we're going to have, I think, quite uh, 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 large uh, structures with, with walls in excess of a metre, perhaps more. Um, so there you can see that if you look at the structure of the stones overlying the collapse, uh, we're trying to record that in, in as much detail as we can uh, using these 3D methods so that we can, we, we can, we, we can analyse them. Uh, uh, And again, you can see the beginnings of wall lines, literally in places just underneath the turf. And uh, this is Jackie McKinley uh, there with, with some of the uh, some of that stonework that, that I was mentioning, uh, with, with this structured collapse that that, that, that we see there. Um, and this gives you uh, some idea. This is the passageway, and. Uh, uh, what we have there, where, the two back, where there's the, those steps at the black and white, um, if, between the, the, the lower marker, if you, if you follow it along, can you see there's a long slab with a, with a big crack that's broken in two almost. And um, if I just point that one out, we can see the complication of, of the archaeology. Uh, but uh, uh, here, can you see that big long slab coming down that crack? That stone is, is resting on a ledge, and there's a corresponding ledge on the other side. And uh, we, we, we've gone down today into this material, and we see that ledge continuing through with, with what appears to be more stone set, up, set onto it. So this, this seems to be the, the roof of... Um, a passageway, so it could be it could, it could be a meter, perhaps in depth. We don't know. It depends if it's a crawl way or, or, or whether it's, it's one of these passages where you would have to stoop to go along. Um, 
But again, uh, exciting things are beginning to, to show uh, um, within the archaeology. Very much early stages. We, uh, we've only had two weeks. Now, it, it took us over a week to clear this. So we've only really had just, just a week and a bit to uh, uh, start excavating. So it, as I say, it's such early stages, but it's tantalizing to see what's there. And uh, again, the, um, you can see some of the set stones, the set altar sets, uh, these upright stones, and you can see collapse coming through. Um, so, uh, for us, uh, incredibly exciting. Uh, and again, one can see the complications in terms of archaeology because we have a, a very clear wall face, a very clear wall face here. But if you look very carefully, can you see a line coming through there? <laughs> so we've got an earlier wall face, and we've almost got a reskinning of whatever's there. We've got a secondary wall face coming coming through here. So a uh, very, very complicated, don't ask me to say and uh, predict what's happening at the moment because I wouldn't like to because every trowelful, it changes. But it's incredibly exciting. Okay, so quickly, what's the potential for what we're doing? Um, well, what we're hoping to do is understand that later RNA sequence is built within the chamber of care. And if you remember at the very beginning, I said there was this association we see in so many monuments where we have an earthy care and the Iron Age. Um, and this is, this is uh, I, I, I think, uh, uh, a little taste of what is possible. And this is not my work, it's the work of uh, uh, Dave Lawrence over there, who, who, who's been, uh, his, his research looked at the material um, re-looking at the, the bone assemblies from uh, Isbiston, Tomb of the, Tomb of the Eagles, and uh, uh, see, seeing what, what's there. A huge amount of potential, I think, from the, the work that Dave's been doing. And uh, uh, what we're hoping is that uh, we, Dave uh, um, will be able, to, uh, uh, be able to bring some of these techniques to, to uh, uh, remains that we may find at, at Swadro. I mean, one of the, the key things that, uh, that he was able to see was that we, we would see um, genetic disorders, uh, uh, diseases that, that were probably uh, hereditary coming down. Um, this premature cranial suture closure it, 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 it is one of them uh, where one would, would, would have some uh, um, visible dis, dis, uh, disfigurement. Uh, you know, they, they, these people uh, would have perhaps stood out in, in, in the population as being slightly different to look at. And they may have also had sensory differences as well. So perhaps, I mean, there are a number of these individuals uh, that they found in the uh, assemblies at Icebister, but also we, we have uh, examples from Rouse, from some of the other tombs, the now Raragar and the now Yaso, for example. Um, so uh, being able to look at disease in the Neolithic uh, and be able to understand the people, I think, is of great importance. And it is, <laughs> pardon the, the, the the pun is, is, is sort of putting the flesh on the bones in terms of trying to understand uh, stand more about the neolithic person uh, than, than one can do from just structural re remains alone. And the other thing that, that Dave was interested in looking at was the amount of trauma that, that was there. So he's seen past injuries, healed injuries in the bone assemblage, but he's also seen perimortem uh, injuries uh, probably you know, occurring at, at the time of death. And lastly, bringing in the, uh, the archaeological science to it, uh, looking at uh, isotopic data. Uh, and this, this is a, a new area of archaeological science that's moving, uh, moving forward at a great rate, trying to understand uh, uh, diet in the past. And, and, and by using the teeth, it, it, it's almost a, a, a capsule, um, a, a, it encapsulates a person's life, so you can actually see changes. You can see uh, when breastfeeding finishes, you can, you can get clues of the diet 
and how that may change over a person's lifetime to some extent, and be able to see whether you know, uh, any differences. And, and they would see that there, was, there seemed to be some, some differences between male, male and female diet, and, uh, uh, and that draws in a whole new set of questions. So, just to summarise then, uh, what, what we see is a huge potential if, if, uh, if we're lucky enough to have uh, good survival of human, human material in that too. Um, so a huge uh, area of research there. Uh, the Iron Age activity on, on that side goes with the rest of the evaluation work that we've done and it's just as exciting in some ways because it is again telling us uh, another dimension about the past and, and what's interesting is we've got that long time continuum going from the uh, uh, first century BC at least probably much earlier all the way through to the Norse period and being able to being able to, to look at uh, uh, the, the changes in farming and fishing strategies and so on in that period. So thank you, but I think I've probably bored you enough, but do come and visit us and perhaps Cass can say something about uh, uh, some of the events that we're, we're having.